the past hundred years, oil has been the lifeblood of America. But in September 2005, a hurricane blew into the Gulf of Mexico that severed the supply of oil to the nation. This is a massive country, and oil serves everything we do every single day. And here came Julia. And all she was doing was just blowing wind. Devastating scenes are being reported in hurricane-stricken New Orleans. The loop pipeline that carries a million barrels of oil into America a day had been severed. Hurricane Julia unleashed a chain of events that would change America forever. Two ships collided at the Houston Ship Channel, a major artery for America's oil industry. Long lines of gas stations and panic at the pump. The price of gas is high and getting higher. People were in a sort of a panic mode. People were bringing plastic milk jugs in, you know, filling them up with gas. It was chaotic, and I, I didn't understand how people became so desperate and treated each other with a, such a disrespect. Americans didn't realize how fragile their existence was. Oil, the black gold of our national economy that had powered our economy, had become an Achilles heel. Disaster followed disaster as the house of cards America was built on collapsed. There's only one country that you can look to for help. That's Saudi Arabia. Normally we get two million barrels of oil a day from Saudis, and now we wanted three million. Any last words for the party soldier? This country was made great by people serving this country. We need to protect our concerns, and our major concern was a, a cheap source of oil. Oil hit a new record price of $153 a barrel today following the blast at Ras Tanura. It has never been that high. The trucking industry is under tremendous further blow to workers in the meat industry, shutting down with the loss of 6,000 jobs. <laughs> The government decided that the smart way to pay for the troops in Saudi Arabia was to cut the farm aid. It was inconceivable to me that in the 21st century that someone is getting frostbite in their own home. How does something like that happen? And, and how do we give oil that much power over our lives? Why is anyone in Washington talking about this? But probably will uh, be viewed as the worst disaster on American soil ever. Friends, pray with me for the well-being of every man, woman, and child. In the summer of 2005, American reliance on oil was at an all-time high. We were the world's number one consumer, burning a quarter of all the oil produced globally. There were two cars for every household. There was even an oil man in the White House. For decades, experts had warned of the day when the supply would run out but no one expected that day to arrive so soon. Off the coast of Louisiana, a Category 4 storm was brewing. but out in the Gulf of Mexico, Hurricane Julia continues to build, and the experts are telling the people of New Orleans to think about evacuating the city. Joining us is Frank Milner. He is the director of emergency management right here in Jefferson Parish. And Frank, what do you say to the folks who have not yet evacuated? Get out while you can. Julia is a category four hurricane. This city is 13 feet below sea level and surrounded by water on three sides. If New Orleans takes a direct hit, we're going to be the next Atlantis.
While the nation worried about the threat posed to the people of New Orleans, the fears of those in the oil industry were focused on a few acres of marshland 60 miles further south. Before Hurricane Julia, most people had never even heard of Port Fouchon, but it was the vital hub of American oil supply, providing more than 15% of the 20 million barrels of oil consumed each day. The port's director of operations, John Hamill, knew he had little margin for error. We didn't know for sure that the hurricane was gonna hit us, but after Hurricane Ivan, I wasn't gonna take any chances. My priority was to get the oil workers the hell out of there. Of course, the evacuation process would uh, save the men, but it wouldn't protect the billions and billions of dollars of oil and the drilling infrastructure out there in the Gulf of Mexico. We extract a million barrels of oil on the rigs supported by the port. That's the bulk of deep water gas and oil production out in the Gulf. And then on top of that, over a million barrels of imported oil comes through the port. That's 13% of the nation's oil imports. The majority of these foreign imports flowed through the essential loop pipeline. It surfaced from the Gulf right outside John Hamill's office. It is a uh, pipeline that runs on the ocean floor, goes out 18 miles into the Gulf, into approximately 120 feet of water. Super tankers, ships pull up from all over the place, attach into it, and then we process it through Port Fouchon. And from there, it's distributed domestically to 30% of the pipelines out into the United States of America. A million barrels a day. That evening, Government officials met to discuss emergency management plans for New Orleans and Port Fouchon should Hurricane Julia strike. Representing the Department of Energy was Under Secretary Jack Roden. We had been following Julia for uh, several days. It had avoided Key West and gone between the narrow straits between Key West and Cuba. So it was time to really be concerned about it. I knew that uh, if the port were devastated, that it would blow a hole in the American economy and that it would affect the livelihoods of everyone in the nation. Forecasters are warning that it's only a matter of hours now before Hurricane Julia strikes the city of New Orleans. By Saturday afternoon, Authorities declared a full-scale state of emergency for Louisiana. Over a million people have been on the move on many of the highways out of New Orleans. It's absolute gridlock. Cars blocked highways, with people desperate to escape the coming storm. Now the mayor is concerned about the 100,000 or so who are not leaving. We have over 100,000 residents that rely upon public transportation to get around the city, so they really do, do not have any means to leave our city. So we will have people in the city that will ride the storm out. Just a short while ago, they opened up the Superdome as what they refer to a shelter of last resort. I live only a few miles away from here. I was born and raised here. I wasn't sure that my people or the people who live down here would actually make it. I knew that potentially tens of thousands of people were going to die. At 6 a.m., Hurricane Julia made landfall, directly hitting Port Fouchon. Slowly inland, Julia tore apart vast areas of southern Louisiana.
devastating scenes are being reported in hurricane-stricken New Orleans. Hundreds are feared dead with emergency services unable to cope. Phone lines are down in many areas, so if you're stuck in a building and you Although the city itself was spared the full force of the hurricane, parishes surrounding New Orleans were devastated. It's never going to be the same again. Many people were lost. And you can't retrieve lives. In Louisiana, 1,476 people would die at the hands of Julia. But the oil crisis that followed would claim tens of thousands more lives in the months to come. That Labor Day weekend, with lines of communication cut off, government officials had no way of knowing the extent of the damage. Everyone was desperate for information. I wanted to give the Secretary of Energy and the President of the United States the best possible advice I could give. But my advice and my counsel was dependent on information from Port Fourchon. As soon as the eye of the storm passed, I was back at the port assessing the damage. The port was an absolute mess. Entire platforms had simply disappeared. had flooded the land for miles and miles and miles and most of the usual landmarks just washed away the Leeville Bridge the only thing that connects the port to the rest of Louisiana gone but then the worst news came when I got back to dry land the loop pipeline that carries a million barrels of oil into America a day had been severed. Done. When John finally reported that we had lost 80% of our Gulf productivity and that we had lost almost all of our imports at the port, I knew that an event like this could impact the lives of every American. And I was concerned our, our economy would simply fall apart. The damage to Port Fouchon would take more than 12 months to repair. At 9.30 a.m., trading began on Wall Street. Oil analyst Ed Matthews witnessed the reaction of the markets. After Labor Day weekend, the market opened on Tuesday, and um, all hell broke loose. Trading for crazy. Absolutely nuts. It had to. People didn't know what the future of the price of crude was going to be. And based on that, they had to speculate. And in speculating, the price went higher and higher and higher. Top traders at the Mercantile Exchange in New York say they've never seen anything like it. Records have been broken as the price of a barrel of crude oil has leapt from $55 to over $70. The markets closed that day at $77 a barrel. And uh, that kind of price shock hits the gas pumps pretty quickly. Long lines at gas stations and panic at the pumps. The price of gasoline is News reports predicted a sharp increase in the price of gasoline, causing chaos at stations around the country. Gas is in short supply, and some drivers are being forced to line up for hours. People were in a sort of a panic mode. People were bringing plastic milk jugs in, you know, filling them up with gas. We were running uh, three, four times the amount of gas through every hour than, than, than normal. Bob and Hazel Knoll own a gas station 70 miles east of San Antonio, Texas. They bought the station in 1990, after Bob had been honorably discharged from the Army. Last thing I wanted after eight years in uniform was to have to take orders from anybody ever again. And with our own business, 
we were able to be around for the boys just the way we always swore we would be. Prices have been going up already for a couple of years since we went into Iraq. But at that time, you know, people were in a sort of a panic mode. Open the dispenser nozzles with your hands. It comes out a little bit quicker that way, please. It was chaotic, and I, I didn't understand um, how people became so panicky and, and so desperate and, and all of a sudden treated each other with a, a, such a disrespect over gas. We can't find the owner of this little SUV. They're going to stay in their cars. This isn't going to work. It was panic buying. It was scary. It wasn't something that I was used to seeing at all. The Knoll's elder son, Joe, had followed his father by joining the Army. That weekend, he was on leave unable to help out. Joe was there to protect, you know, the, the station and the family and make sure no one got hurt and just to try to keep the peace, so to speak. 14-year-old Elliot documented the events on home video. Well, Dad had asked me to keep the camera running in case, I mean, real trouble broke out. We needed something to show the cops. Oh, my hey, God, man. Oh, hey, 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 I felt sorry, but it was like it was our fault, and it's not our fault. Now we're just trying to run a business, and uh, all of a sudden we're looked at as the enemy, and uh, so that really scared me. That part, the anger toward us. Well, when people hear, rightly or wrongly, that there is no gas, I mean, they panic. They need gas. They have to have it. All this does is push the supply even harder. Um, prices on Wall Street go up and up. People panic even more. Uh, we have a cycle of paranoia here. In this case, this cycle of paranoia could only be calmed down by the government. The devastation of Port Fouchon had left the nation with a shortfall of over 10% of its daily intake of oil. When you're experiencing a 2 million barrel shortfall per day, that's 14 million in a week. Unless you make up the shortage, it will affect everybody. The mother driving kids to school. The teamster driving meat to a wholesaler. Our ability to fly individuals from one part of the country to the next because our airline industry is so dependent on oil. I wanted to prevent that by utilizing the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve, or SPR, was established after the oil crisis of the 1970s. By 2005, it stockpiled 700 million barrels of oil and was considered an emergency option for presidents facing a shortage. Releasing the SPR was a big decision. A formal announcement was made at 9 o'clock this morning that 1 million barrels of oil will be released from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve every day for the next month. This will be a loan from the government to the private oil companies. We expect that with this release, it will relieve the pressure on the markets and reduce the sense of panic. The government's action did just that. Within hours, the price of oil dropped below $70. But the SPR was only a short-term solution to the crisis. With the reconstruction of Port Fouchon just beginning, the only answer was to look outside our borders for more oil. When you have as an abrupt a shortfall as we did, there's only one country that you can look to for help. That's Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia holds over a quarter of all the world's oil reserves was the only country capable of increasing supply without delay. After much discussion, it was decided that we would send Sasha Stanimir, the president's chief foreign affairs advisor, to Riyadh. He had uh, built up a very special relationship with a Saudi family. 
I have known uh, Al Naimi for 10 years. He is a friend. So he will do for me things that he will perhaps not do for Jack Rodden or even for President Bush, whom he does not know so well. It is all personal relationships. They are very important in these things. Since 9-11, tensions between the Saudi royal family and fundamentalist agitators have been running high. In Saudi Arabia, outside the royal family, America is not popular. The Osama bin Laden, the fundamentalists, they hate America. And many ordinary Saudis have some sympathy. And for a Saudi government official, for a Saudi prince, to help America in time of trouble is a risk. Despite this, the Saudis agreed to increase their supply to the U.S. from 2 million to 3 million barrels a day. Were they reckless? To a certain extent, yes. Were they greedy? Yes. Um, the Saudis, they live very, very wealthy lives, especially the Saudi royal family. So uh, when they heard they were going to make uh, top dollar on an extra million barrels of oil a day, did they jump at it? You bet they did. The Saudi deal was a welcome relief for the government. But it would take six weeks before the extra oil would begin to arrive. More and more gas stations were now running dry. Any comments for our viewing public on this unfortunate turn of events? Yeah, I have a comment. Which is? This thing is like a blessing and not very much of a disguise. My brother was always a bit strange. Could you explain yourself, sir? No. You just make fun of me. Just say it. No way. Say it. Okay, okay. Maybe this whole oil crisis thing is like God's way of saying, are you sure you guys can't think of a better way to take care of yourself without pumping poison into the air? Elliot's attitude toward religion was, uh, and still is, that he he closely examines every aspect of it. He's, he's not only creative, he's very analytical. And um, he wants to know answers. I'm definitely a firm believer. I'm going to follow God and Jesus and... There's no way I could falter from them. Hazel, a lay minister at the local church, was also a firm believer. We never did try to push faith on Elliot. No, we saw how much good that did with Joe. And we just left it up to the Lord to make that happen. And I guess he knew that with what was around the corner, Elliot was going to need all the faith he could get. While the Knowles struggled with the oil crisis, events were unfolding in Saudi Arabia that would blow their lives and the whole nation apart. Breaking news out of Daman, Saudi Arabia, where Islamic militants have seized control of a shopping mall. Unconfirmed reports suggest that over 300 Westerners were being held hostage by suspected Islamic fundamentalists. My heart sank when I heard the news. And I thought it might have something to do with Sasha Stanimir's deal with the Saudis. And um, it turned out I was right. The fundamentalists do not want to have the Saudi royal family dealing with the United States. It was particularly terrible for me because as soon as it had happened, I realized I should have expected it. The fear of Saudi Arabia collapsing into chaos sent a shockwave through the markets. Gasoline prices skyrocketed. Oh, I'll never forget that moment. My broker called me up. That's how it works when you run a gas station. Your broker calls you every day and they tell you what prices to put up. And the number that came out of his mouth, mm -hmm. I thought I had to be hearing him wrong. Mm -hmm. Viewer discretion advised. <sighs> Weeks after Hurricane Julia, the oil crisis took a desperate turn when Islamic terrorists in Saudi Arabia took 300 Western oil workers hostage at gunpoint. Breaking news this morning, the Al Rashid Mall in the eastern province is now under the control of an armed militia calling itself Many the Western oil workers are said to be held hostage in this building. 
terrorists release a statement saying they would execute one hostage every hour. The terrorists have demanded that the Saudi Arabians revoke the agreement to increase its oil supply to America. We had become accustomed to attacks on Western oil workers in the Middle East, but the scenes that unfolded that day, we were not prepared for. My heart just dropped. It was really quite an emotional experience for me because we've had so many workers over in Saudi Arabia for so many years. You felt like you were watching your family members being held hostage and broadcast throughout the entire world. From behind me, as you can probably hear, there is heavy gunfire. It's absolute chaos. This morning, the building was stormed by Saudi security forces attempting to release the hostages. Saudi security forces do not negotiate. They don't believe in negotiation. They believe in uh, shooting first, ask questions later. The chilling sound of loud explosions followed. But in this case, it didn't work, and many Americans died. Emergency services have only now been allowed access to the building. So far, they are estimating up to 100 fatalities. Many Americans are expected to be among the dead. The total death toll from the Al Rashid Mall hostage situation has reached 107, according to sources in Washington. Well, when there were so many American casualties at the Al Rashid Mall, it made me wonder about the security of America's workers on foreign soil. I knew that uh, the oil industry would never be the same again. In Saudi Arabia, fundamentalist supporters took to the streets. The kingdom erupted into anarchy. Saudi Arabia was a time bomb that exploded. There was a real concern that the royal family would lose control of the country and that the fundamentalists would simply turn off the faucets of oil. Because oil fields basically, you know, they're sitting ducks. And you have open pipelines. You tie a couple of sticks of dynamite to a pipeline and you shut down the entire refinery for weeks, months on end. When the CEO of the second largest oil company in the Middle East calls you and tells you he's pulling half of his employees from Saudi Arabia, you have to take action. We need to protect our concerns, and our major concern was a, a cheap source of oil. Breaking news. Washington has announced that it will be dispatching 5,000 troops. This morning, Fort Hood's 4th Infantry Division took off from Dallas Airport. The soldiers are the first consignment of troops heading for key oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. The mission for the troops was to support local security forces protecting the oil infrastructure across the country, including the centerpiece of the Saudi oil industry, its largest refinery, Ras Tanura. For families who would see their children dispatched to the Middle East, the news was greeted with a mixture of pride and trepidation. Well, that's good, right? I mean, Saudi Arabia is not Iraq, is it? No, ma'am. What? What was that? Nothing. I didn't say anything. I would categorize myself as extremely patriotic. Um, I historically have been a great believer that this country was made great by people serving this country. Hey, bro. Any last words for the departing soldier? Besides don't go? Yeah, besides that. I was proud of him. His father came from the military, and, um, you know, he wanted to do right by his father as well and his country, and so I was there for him. I want you to keep the camera. I continued filming so that Joe would still see it. I mean, if I filmed it, then he would know what was going on. You never really know what's going to come your way, but I did do my best to act supportive. But at the same time, uh, you know, a mother just tends to worry. Everyone hoped the deployment of troops would help reduce the price of gas remained at over six dollars a gallon. 
President Bush took action to ease the country's fears. In a move to find new solutions to the oil crisis, President Bush today appointed Deputy Secretary of Energy Jack Roden to the newly created position of oil czar. The president promised that Roden would have the authority to take whatever action was necessary to ease the crisis, including use of police and National Guard to implement new controls. It was certainly a daunting task that I had before me. Uh, we had some very, very difficult problems in this country, and, and I was happy and pleased to serve the administration and the president and the people of the United States. Mr. Roden, any news on the release of the SPR? No comment. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Roden had pushed for the release of oil from the SPR after Hurricane Julia. Now oil czar, he set forth two bold initiatives. First, to ensure the release of SPR oil for another six weeks. Second, to introduce a 50 mile an hour speed restriction to reduce demand for gas. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have a brief announcement to make. This announcement pertains to Executive Order 11746. This executive order imposes a national maximum speed limit of 50 miles per hour. Drivers will pay higher fares at interstate toll roads and carpooling restrictions are tightened. There is a crisis in America, but there is no crisis of the American spirit. Thank you very much. There is a crisis in America. But there is no crisis in the American spirit. Nixon used that line back in the 70s. Funny how history has a way of repeating itself, don't you think? Some of Roden's policies were deeply unpopular. Speed restrictions slowed down trucking across the country at a time when the industry was already reeling from unprecedented gas prices. The truckers took their protest to Washington, D.C. Truckers from all over the country congregated in Washington this morning to demonstrate against new measures restricting speed limits. Truckers are demanding tax breaks and financial incentives to get them back on the road. The trucking industry is under tremendous pressure, and it's time for the United States Congress and the President of the United States to recognize these difficulties and deal with them and not just issue promises. These new speed restrictions are going to kill our business. I mean, I'm already losing money. What does the government want us to do? Work for nothing? America's trucks can't move around freely. We don't have the ability to get freight to our stores, to our malls, to uh, the mass of population that we have that lives uh, in the suburban outreaches of our country. There was growing desperation across the country extra supplies were on their way. The additional oil pledged by the Saudis was finally about to arrive, and the oil czar made sure he was there to welcome it. Undersecretary, do you really believe the arrival of six tankers of oil from Saudi Arabia will make a difference? There are six today, there will be six next week, and six the week after that. We're very grateful to our friends the Saudis and to OPEC for increasing the level of production and exports to the United States. Thank you very much. The tankers docked at the port of Houston, the center of America's oil refining industry. Since the loss of the Loop pipeline, Houston had taken on the task of handling the majority of oil imported via the Gulf of Mexico. In charge of keeping tanker traffic flowing to the port was Howard Gibbons. Well, for two months, ever since Hurricane Julia took out Port Fouchon, hundreds of ships have been rerouted to the port of Houston. And as chief uh, Coast Guard operator, I'm under pressure to ensure the safe and swift passage of these vessels. The port is in trouble, the economy's in trouble, and Jack Roden was all too eager to remind me of that. It was critical that the port of Houston cope with the increased traffic. Shell and Exxon have some of the largest oil refineries along the channel. The SPR alone couldn't provide enough oil to keep those refineries going at full throttle. In order to do that, we had to keep imports flowing into that channel and to that port. 
Well, the problem for me was that uh, Houston was already running at maximum capacity, and it was problematic to bring in any extra ships uh, safely. Typically, 450 vessels come through here every day. Uh, close to 100 more had been rerouted to the port. Uh, Roden was quick to ask for daily reports as crude was backing up in the channel. Oil for Christmas. That's what I promised, and that's what I planned to deliver. Roden's bold promise would be his undoing. As fall rolled into winter, fog forced the Coast Guard to close the Houston ship channel. Well, the port had been closed for 24 hours because of heavy fog, and uh, hundreds of ships were waiting to get into port. Everyone was yelling at me to open the port. Uh, the Department of Energy uh, companies were losing millions of dollars because they couldn't get their cargo to dock. Uh, ship captains who were getting grief from their own bosses. So uh, when the fog lifted, we reopened the port, um, and all hell broke loose. Under mounting pressure to keep oil flowing, hundreds of ships had to be guided safely through the channel as quickly as possible. But its narrow design made navigation especially hazardous. The ship channel runs about 53 miles. As you work your way up the channel and get past Morgan's Point, it's reduced to about 300 feet wide. And then in addition to that, it's quite winding. There's a lot of S-turns, and, and so it gets a little bit more precarious as you're heading up towards the port of Houston. At a sharp turn by the Texas City refinery, two large vessels, each 120 feet wide, attempted to pass. What we had was a perfect combination for an explosion. Uh, we had an oil tanker and a chemical container ship, and, uh, and they collided. Well, it was, the, uh, it was the worst day of my career. Two ships collided at the critical choke point of the Houston Ship Channel, Morgan's Point, near Highway 146, early this morning. Reasons for the disaster remain unclear. We have to take calculated risks. And yes, in this situation, I acknowledge that this was a calculated risk that was taken and we lost as a result of it. While no loss of life is expected, it's been forecast that the channel, a major artery for America's oil industry, will be closed for up to three weeks, a situation that will only exacerbate the oil crisis. Despite all the efforts of the government, the oil supply to the country had been cut once again. The situation for America would only become more grave. Houston would cease. The oil crisis could only escalate. The collision in Houston was a direct result of Hurricane Julia hitting Port Fouchon. If uh, Fouchon and the Loop pipeline hadn't been destroyed, you wouldn't have seen the intense buildup of traffic in Houston. And overloading it only made matters worse. The explosion itself, from what I understand, was heard all the way to downtown Houston. It was profound. And uh, the environmental damage of the crude oil and the toxic chemicals, it pretty much shut down the upper channel. It was devastating. This was the icing on the cake. We had this bottleneck that was now clogged with oil. Where were we going to reroute the ships now? California? All that would do is uh, take more time and uh, waste more money. And the effect on the economy was, was obvious. All I had to do was look at the news or look at the local gas prices or look at the gas lines. I knew what was going on. The fact that we couldn't get oil into one of the largest refining bases in Houston and uh, the supply goes way down and the price goes way up. Everything got so expensive I had to hike the prices in the store so high nobody would buy anything anyway. I was just hoping and praying, you know, that Joe and his buddies would fix everything up in the Middle East so we could all get back to business. A further blow to workers in the meat industry, following the closure of three more processing plants across the country, employers are blaming the ongoing trucking boycott for the loss of business. As the economy floundered, 
the pressure on government intensified. Many people laid the blame at the door of the oil czar. Eventually, it became obvious that uh, Jack Rodden was no good, that he was not capable of dealing with such a crisis. When I asked Gibbons to keep that channel open, I thought I was acting in the best interests of the nation. This morning, Jack Roden resigned from the post of oil czar, citing personal reasons. Roden's replacement is expected to be announced by the end of the week. The administration made a savvy, if unexpected, choice for the new oil czar. I was surprised. I thought perhaps it would be someone who was born in America whom I could advise. But uh, I take my hat off to Condoleezza Rice and to President Bush. They appoint someone who is not born in their country because, in all honesty, I believe I was the best man for the job. Sasha Stanimir grew up in the Soviet Union and had worked in the oil ministry under Leonid Brezhnev in the 1970s. A gifted linguist, Stanimir defected to the U.S. in 1985 and became a citizen in 1998. The former communist official would now assume a crucial role in helping to keep America afloat. The very difficult thing at this time was dealing with the immediate economic costs. The dollar was falling in value and businesses were failing. There was a budget crisis because there was less money coming in, there was more money that needed to be paid for the oil that did come in because the price had gone through the roof. And at the same time, the American government has to maintain troops in Iraq and send more troops to Saudi Arabia. This is not cheap. And so something has to give. In America, was spending uh, over a billion dollars a day and had 130,000 troops in Iraq. Everybody knew that the American economy could not sustain a second major large-scale military force. Budget cuts had to be made across the board, and one of the places was the federal subsidy to farmers. Farmers were dealt a further blow this morning with the announcement that federal aid to farms would be cut by 50% effective January 1st. One of the many farms that would be hit by the cuts was owned by Adam and Mary McGrath. I was afraid we were going to lose the farm. The government, in its wisdom, decided that the smart way to pay for the troops in Saudi Arabia was to cut the farm aid that had barely kept us competitive with cheap foreign wheat. The farm had been in the McGrath family for over a century. Already hit hard by the hike in oil prices, its future was now in jeopardy. When you think about the price of oil going up, you don't think about the price of oil-based fertilizers going up and pesticides. We were hit by transportation cost, price of beef. It affected everything. Adam was not happy. He was scared to death that after six generations of McGrath men working this land, that he was gonna be the one to lose it. But Adam was not willing to let his farm go without a fight. Adam had just been elected to the board of the SDFA, the South Dakota Farmers Alliance. He started petitions, he started meetings, and it was exciting. The government's argument was that they were looking out for the long term. Adam was wondering what in the long term they thought would be here. As states in the north settled in for a long, cold winter, the oil shortage would create a wholly different crisis. In New England, where many homes rely on heating oil, people watched with a deep sense of foreboding as the first snows of the season began to fall. If you're not prepared, you could find yourself in serious trouble. With temperatures well below freezing, it won't take... The cities of America's east coast have seen nothing like it. Tens of millions trapped, cars buried, airports closed. There have been 20 deaths so far, the old and the homeless most at risk. 
Boston TV station WGB9 had begun to shoot a documentary about the city's EMS crews. The footage would provide an insight into the catastrophic effects of the heating oil shortage. One of the featured EMTs at the front line of the battle with the cold was Estelle Sanders. Boston, more than almost any other city in this country, um, depends much more on heating oil than anybody else. So when it started to get cold, Still I mean, I guess it was like just the worst timing. Frostbite. What are we, I'm on Everest? It was inconceivable to me that in the middle of Boston, in an apartment, in the 21st century, that someone is getting frostbite in their own home. And I wish I could say that was the last time I saw that. Let's get him on the stairs here and get him out of here. Charities and social agencies in the city were struggling as increasing numbers of people simply couldn't afford to heat their homes. Colleen Hughes runs HTA, one of the largest heating oil charities in Massachusetts. I mean, typically we see 30,000 applications for aid. This winter, we hit a new record, 120,000. HT had been flooded with applications for help this winter. Federal funding for local fuel assistance programs just isn't keeping pace with the surge in energy prices. We know that some just won't get the heating oil in time. Among those barely able to pay for heating oil was Estelle's mother. Me. The closest person to me my whole life has always been my mother. Uh, it was pretty much just the two of us, me growing up. Oh, girl, have a good day. Always good. Always good. See you. Yeah. And my mom had her share of medical problems over the years. She was in and out of depression. She um, it's freezing in here. I developed a respiratory condition over the years, uh, different things. And it was part of why I wanted to learn anything about medicine and how to help people because I just grew up wanting to be able to help her, wanting to be able to figure out what was going on with her. Did you take your medicine today? No, I was just about to, just, just before you came in, I was gonna... Yeah, why don't we take it now? She wasn't feeling the medications she was supposed to do. And if she wasn't eating the things she was supposed to, things like that, because she was trying to save money here and there. Try real hard. Okay, look, you look. Deep, breathe deep. Deep, slow down. Slow down. Hold on. I'll put this over your head. Hold on. There you go. Deep breath. Deep breath. She didn't really have anybody else but me. She didn't have like a big group of friends or anything. So if I wasn't there, she was alone. America faced a bleak Christmas. The country, gripped by the oil crisis for three months, was suffering shortages of not just gas, but food. In some stores, the shelves were almost bare. But on Christmas Eve, there was some good news. The Houston Ship Channel reopened for traffic. It was time now to get back to work and bring the uh, petroleum to the country. After a lot of soul searching, I feel like the, the Coast Guard uh, did their job, that we were not at fault. And unfortunately, this, uh, this accident happened, so I can't say what I would have done differently. But the high costs of holiday travel would force many families to spend Christmas apart from their loved ones. Normally, for Christmas, Bob's folks fly down from Chicago, my parents drive down from Tulsa, uh, my brother comes over from Hawaii. Thank God they gave us that webcam hookup with Joe. You got it? He's on. Now we got Hinkle. Joe's on. Hey, hey, hey. Merry Christmas, America. How you folks doing? I miss Joe like crazy. It's so weird not having somebody there. I mean, you're close to your parents, but a brother. And we were, we could tell each other stuff. Joe! Sweetie, how are you? That tree looks great. Is mom making a turkey? Oh, baby, it's so good to see you. How are you? We love you, son. I miss you. It's good to see him. I know. Why are we going to talk to him longer?
Hazel had a wonderful idea. Instead of everyone off home alone in their own badly heated houses, we'd gather for a Christmas lunch in the social hall. You know, be a potluck and the church would spring for a couple of baked hams. It was nice. Everybody is hard at work in the kitchen, all except for Dad. He's just eating. Dad, Dad, aren't you supposed to be preparing some food? Stop eating it all. Save some for the rest of us. We're trying to figure out. Haven't said the blessing. That's a sheep or a hippo. It was an incredible day in many ways. You know, for the first time that year, I felt like everybody knew we were all in that same leaky boat. And if we didn't all learn how to row together, we were all going to sink together. Can I have everyone's attention, please, for just a moment? I just want to start out by saying, I know we would all like to thank the Lord that the year 2005 is almost over. <laughs> Stan, he brought down this big projector TV from the sports bar he has, and he was going to show like a movie for all the little kids to watch. For that, I mean, we were just running all the normal Christmas stuff. But the joyful mood of the Knowles Church was about to be shattered. You know that hair, it really brings out your eyes. Well, thank you. Yeah, and that dress. Is... Yeah! Breaking news for you now of an explosion at the Ras Tanura oil refinery in Saudi Arabia. That's a facility being guarded by American troops. My first inclination when I saw the news was, well, Joe's all right. But I say as soon as I uh, saw Hazel's face, I, I pretty much knew, and I've come to, to trust that. We are expecting significant American casualties. I just knew. Gone. Joe Knoll was one of the 142 American soldiers who died in the Christmas Day attack on Raz Tanura. I'm Morgan Spurlock, and in my film, Super Size Me, it took only 30 days. A fictitious program. No actual events or news broadcasts are used in this program. This program is for entertainment purposes only. gone since Christmas Day. A mother knows. A mother just knows. <laughs> they told us we couldn't see the body. Too badly burnt. They told us that he was probably standing near the heart of the blast and that it all happened so fast that he couldn't have possibly felt any pain. I couldn't take it anymore. I had to go inside and Hazel stayed out talking with him. I don't know how she found the strength to do it. One of those boys didn't look one day older than Joe. And I asked him if he thought he would be going over there and he said he expected to be shipped out by spring. Then he asked me to pray for him. And I still do every day. I mean, he told me to film that stuff for him. I'll be back to watch it. Oh, y'all don't worry about me. I'm not even going to be in a dangerous place. But it was real weird. Not having him at all was so hard. I never imagined that I'd be burying my own son. If I could have taken his place, I would have. At that point, I, I began to question. I did question God. I did question things. You don't want your son to die in vain, now, do you? Islamic terrorists linked with Al-Qaeda have now appeared on the website of Arab news agency Al Jazeera. They are claiming responsibility for the Christmas Day attack on the Saudi oil facility Ras Tanira that left 142 American soldiers dead. A brief 
فيك سوف تستمر باشغال البلاد الاسلاميه الجنه للمخلصين الذين فدوا انفسهم للتحريب والتحديم امريكا نصر من الله وفتح غريب The destruction of Raz Tanura struck a hammer blow to an already fragile America. The terrorists had simultaneously attacked the smaller port of Yanbu and the main pipeline that fed oil to the Suez Canal. With Saudi production now down by a third, the impact would cripple the global oil economy. When the stock market reopened on December 27, the Dow took the biggest daily drop in its history. The fall of 2005 had been bad, but the new year was to be a lot worse. Rostenur is the single most important facility in the entire oil industry. It's a vital artery for all oil exports, and the impact on world markets was immediate. On New York's mercantile exchange, oil futures traded at $153 a barrel. Oil hit a new record price of $153 a barrel today following the blast at Ras Tanura. It has never been that high. We were quite frankly expecting to see it go higher. $200 a barrel oil was not going to be a shock to us anymore. Well, suddenly in Europe and Japan, countries that had offset the rising price of oil against the falling dollar were suddenly facing real shortages. Only the economically strong could survive. At the gas pumps, $153 a barrel oil means the price of gas over $8 a gallon, at least. Gasoline today reached a record $8 a gallon in Malibu, California. The question for consumers is, how high can it go? Well, the average station wagon, the average SUV, carries about a 25-gallon tank. You're talking uh, $200 to fill up your gasoline tank. Nobody could afford $8 a gallon gasoline. It was changing the way that we did business and the way we conducted our lives here in the United States. Businesses operating close to the margins were being destroyed. For farmer Mary McGrath, it would change her life in ways she didn't expect. With Adam out on the barricades, most of the time it was just me on the farm. And nine out of ten chores were not getting done. Unimportant little chores like planting next year's wheat. The only people Mary could turn to were her two sons, Nick and Tom. But they had their own lives away from the farm in Chicago. She would called on a regular basis to try to get me to, to come, and I, I just remember thinking, <laughs> you nuts? Last thing I'm going to do is come back to the farm. Within a shorter period of time, I lost probably 80% of my business. Nick first lost his job managing his restaurant in Chicago. Then Tom had to close down his printing business. You know, I guess printing brochures for restaurants doesn't have a real high priority when restaurant owners can't even afford their heating bill. And the boys were not going to make it down in Chicago. They knew they had to come here. It's strange to feel so secure in something like that. You're living this nice, secure, middle-class life, and it's just like, you ever seen one of those trap doors that just opens up, and you just feel like you, you just fell through? Didn't know how my children were going to eat. I think that's what finally made me decide to gather up the, the money we could and pack everyone up in a car and drive back home. I think they did it a tad begrudgingly. But once they got here, I think they realized that it was a family effort. We had to work together or we would not make it. With hundreds of businesses declaring bankruptcy, the government accelerated its search for new supplies of oil outside the Middle East. We needed to shift our focus away from Saudi Arabia. We couldn't rely on Saudi for oil, at least in the short term. We urgently needed to strengthen relationships with other oil-producing countries. which already produced 8 million barrels a day, suddenly became an even bigger player. Oil czar Sasha Stanimir has just arrived in Moscow for high-level talks with advisors to Russian President Vladimir Putin. 
The last time a Russian fleet sailed on the United States, JFK was president, and the two nations were in the middle of the Cold War Cuban Missile Crisis. Today, a new fleet was being ready to head across the Atlantic, but this time in peace, bringing aid to their transatlantic allies. Our friends, the Russians, have come to the aid of all Americans today in our time of crisis. The government of Vladimir Putin, in association with privatized oil companies, has agreed to immediately send four super tankers, each carrying two million barrels of oil, to the U.S. in time for Easter. For me, this deal had a much greater significance for the future of the global oil industry. I was hoping that this would be the first of many such deals. The Russian oil deal would buy the economy more time to correct itself. But for many, it would be too little, too late. Life. Who had a life? I was working insane hours. The city was, was one big medical emergency. I was spending everything I could on I'm keeping my mom comfortable. I mean, I, I'd visit her every couple days, bring her meals. When she wasn't taking her medicines and everything, I mean, of course, it aggravated her, her respiratory condition and all that. So, I mean, I guess like everybody else, she started to deteriorate. I was on the McClellan when I heard her address come over the radio. Steve, was that my mom's address? Can we call it in? We had this guy in the back who was critical. Can we respond? So, there was nothing I could do. We couldn't turn around. It was my own mother, and there was nothing I could do. following contains strong language and violence. Viewer discretion advised. In Boston alone, the heating oil crisis would claim over 24,000 lives. Estelle Sanders' mother would be among those who perished. In the 21st century, in the United States of America, no one should have to die like my mother did because they can't afford medicine or, or, or they can't afford to keep their homes. So Estelle, what are you doing today? In my mother's thing. I miss her. She should be here. doesn't make any sense that she's not. With the death toll rising, more and more people began to question the value America had placed on oil. Protest movements began growing, and the most vocal were the farmers, led by Adam McGrath. 226 thousand signatures on that petition and we might as well have wrapped it around a brick and dropped it down a well. The farmers barely got so much as a we'll give you a call. The people identified with Adam and the union saw that and pushed him right to the front and started sending him to these rallies. Farmers today took to the streets and cities across the nation to protest against cuts in federal assistance. When they're facing the great food shortage in 06, They'll be on their knees begging for the good old days, when it was oil they didn't have enough of. Everything he said rang true. As politicians look hard for new oil sources, it's clear from today's demonstration in South Dakota, the American public is losing its patience. He went after it, and I think it scared a few people. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt would have stood before you before all of this began and he would have said, people, we are one nation. We can live without gasoline. We can live without oil. We can't live without food. 
America needs to recognize that. This country has its priorities passed backwards. And if they don't turn it around and turn it around fast, we'll be plowing our crops into the ground. There'll be 20,000 marching the state capitol to show them that we mean it. Food, not oil. But we, we say, say food, not oil. Food, not oil. desperate country placed its hopes in the fleet of tankers heading across the Atlantic from Russia. Ten days before the ships were due to enter the Gulf of Mexico, events took a dramatic turn. The latest reports confirm that the vessels have changed course. A body blow to American fortunes tonight as China outbids America for Russian oil. Did I know that the Chinese were planning to outbid the Americans? I had heard rumors. Everyone knew how desperate China was for oil. It's the world's second biggest oil consumer. The Bush administration has asked for urgent talks, but no word as yet has come from Beijing. With a population of more than a billion and a booming economy, China was a nation also in dire need of oil. Having vast financial resources available to them, the Chinese would pay the Russians any price to get the much-needed crew. You must understand, the one thing that really drives these oil companies is money. They don't care if it is American or Chinese. Boy, when I heard the news about China, I went up to Elliot. I said, son, someday you're going to be able to tell your grandkids you remember the day America's number came up. 230 years of power and glory, you were there the day she bit the dust. Only you'll probably be saying it in Chinese. I admit, it was a huge psychological blow to the nation. America had lost the economic battle. And there was no way those of us in the administration could uh, put a different spin on it. Well, from the moment that Hurricane Julia hit Port Fouchon, we knew that the economy would suffer. But when those tankers turned around, it was a huge turning point. We realized that we had gone from a recession into a depression. Unemployment has hit an all-time high. As many as three in five men are out of work in this suburb of Michigan. Shops in once busy areas are closing, as people say they can now only afford essential items. It's the basis of an economic structure that people's needs are met by a certain price. You had people that they were willing to pay any price for oil, and if they couldn't get it, they were almost willing to kill for it. The national mood darkened. Bob Knoll had already lost a son. He was about to come face to face with his own mortality. About uh, 2.30 in the afternoon, broad daylight, a couple of uh, teenagers come in. Uh... Well, mom called me. I was really freaking out. There's like just some guys broke into the store. One of them was wearing a mask. The other just kind of hooded up with a gun. It almost seemed like they were enjoying themselves. They were just getting in that atmosphere of, hey, you know, the world's going to hell. We're a part of it. And then dad, she sounded like she was mad that he did. Something clicked in me. He just went after him with a baseball bat, and they turned around and shot him. It was 23 lousy dollars, just as uh, ridiculous as it was for Joe to die for, you know, gas and oil. I thought it was ridiculous that some kids would come and, and nearly take my husband's life over, you know, chump change. When Dad came home, Things just got worse between him and mom. I mean, he was always losing it. He was just always getting mad about something. Hey, Dad. Hey, Al. going? Hey, Mom. Hey, baby. Can you get the door? 
It was like there was never any peace between us. We were always at war with each other. Leave Kelly. Leave us alone. This conversation's over. That's one of the places where I feel most bad about because we're both adults and we have our own way of coping and I didn't give Elliot the kind of uh, guidance uh, that he needed at the time and uh, he had to do some growing up real quick. Mom even got mad. Mom is not much of a angry person but she got to where she would yell at us a couple times. All I could think of was, why were we going through the worst thing that ever happened to us, alone? How does something like that happen? And, and how do we give oil that much power over our lives? We had the realization, finally, I think, that we needed to stop being so on foreign oil. It was about time we started developing other sources of domestic oil and not being so addicted to cheap and ready sources of oil from foreign countries because it wasn't going to be reality in the future. It was um, very difficult to return the economic structure of cheap oil back to its uh, exalted place in the United States economy without cheap oil. With oil virtually unaffordable, gas stations began to disappear off the map of America. Eventually, we started losing business. You know, it got so we weren't making enough money to even pay our bills. So it didn't make any sense to keep it open. All summer long, FX turns up the heat. Everybody down! With explosive primetime movie premieres. Black Hawk Down. Tears of the Sun. High Crime. Basic. Triple X. Taken and stirred. Made in Manhattan. The Hot Chest. Swim Fat. Just Married. And phone Booth. The hottest movies all summer long are only on FX. Oil Storm is brought to you by Warner Brothers House of Wax. This place is disgusting. I feel dirty just being here. All right. I've got one last thing I want you to see. I, uh, I think you're gonna like this. Santa! Yes. It's a beer tree. Honey, we're home. Bud Light, fresh, smooth, real. Nothing quite like a beer straight from the tree. It's all here. Hey, I'm Jimmy. I'm Terry. I'm John. And I'm one of Earthlink's 2,000 employees. I'm your internet service provider. Your ISP. I am not a giant server in an air-conditioned room. I'm a living, breathing, hardworking internet person. Just like you. I'm watching out for you on the internet 24-7. We've created spam blocker. Virus blocker. Spyware blocker. Scam blocker. If there's a problem, we create a blocker for it. We love our jobs. We love what we do and we enjoy it. We're here to protect and serve you. More speed, more security, that's Earthlink. Earthlink, we revolve around you. <laughs> you want my advice? You should never... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Only at Friday's new Steakhouse Selects. Choose your cut in one of our signature butter sauces. It'll leave you speechless. Everyone could use more Fridays. From the creators of Stargate SG-1... You yeah, have a go. ...comes the next thrilling series. Lock and load. We're going too fast. Stargate Atlantis Rising on DVD June 7th. young boy once stood here and sang, sang his heart out, a heart he later gave to basketball. So he traded in singing for passing, and he left this corner and went all the way to the NBA Finals. William and Middle got a soul singing boy. The rest of us got magic. Magic Johnson! 
The finals, where legends are born. The NBA finals start Thursday, 8.30 Eastern on ABC. Can you tell the difference between these pet medications? They're the same brand, but this medication costs a lot less and is delivered right to my door. That's the 1-800-PET-MED difference. Great savings, fast service, free shipping. Order now. Unidentified female, hands degloved, face sliced off. I trust you understand what it would mean to work for me. Places you'll be required to go. I've already been to those places. You only think you have. The Inside, series premiere next week on Fox. Viewer discretion advised. Care One Debt Management Program. It is your path out. The people who provide Care One credit counseling services know how to help you get out of debt and get on with your life. People are truly amazed when they call us and they see what we can do to help. Look for a solution today. Call us because we can do amazing things. Talk to the people who can help, to the people who care. Call or visit online for Care One Credit Counseling today. Care One for you. unforgettable moments at Sandals Ultra All-Inclusive Resorts. Call 1-800-SANDALS. Season premiere of Rescue Me, Tuesday, June 21st, only on FX. By the middle of spring, the oil crisis that had gripped the nation for nearly eight months was beginning to strangle the American spirit. Every move the government had made to alleviate the situation had failed. Major industries were teetering on the brink of collapse. In a further blow to local industry, the Rouge plant and General Motors plant in Dearborn are shutting down with a loss of 6,000 jobs. At one time, they were the largest assembly plants in America. In a few days, their gates will close for the last time. Today, a fourth major carrier announced that it would seek Chapter 11 bankruptcy. It's just too expensive to get these planes off the ground. We are now operating a minimum service. We apologize to all our loyal customers. But it was disaster after disaster. And the price of oil was driving the price of retail goods way up, the price of commodities. Uh, people were losing their livelihoods. You had the double whammy of inflation and unemployment. Um, people were divesting themselves of the stock market. They were getting rid of anything that had to do with oil, which was uh, pretty much anything. A spokesman for the makers of the gas-guzzling Humvee said that it was no longer viable to produce the car, which was widely criticized by environmentalists for its poor fuel efficiency. People were being forced to re-examine how they lived. The suburban ideal of the heartland of America which had grown up around the automobile, was becoming unsustainable. So many of my friends just completely moved away. They couldn't afford to pay utilities or to pay a mortgage or something like that. It was weird. I used to just get on my bike and go over to a friend's house, but it dawned on me. I was like, nobody lives in my neighborhood anymore. The hood, bro. The Holdens are gone. The Withrows, the Murphys. And guess who else? Mom. Yes, I left. We missed two mortgage payments and the bank wasn't smiling. We need some cash. I went to work in San Antonio. pretty shook up after the shooting. Uh, let the station slide a little bit. Uh, it's actually a little while before I could even go back in there. Uh, and I just as soon gotten shot again than talk about it, which is tough on 
Hazel and Elliot. I don't want anybody to know that he felt pain and suffering and he was getting emotional. He was in Joe's room. He looked so vulnerable. I felt real sorry for him. He never showed his deep emotional side before. He was always, you know, big tough guy, so. But I'm kind of glad he did. You need to say goodbye. You really do. I knew that if I would just give Bob his space and, and the time to explore his feelings and deal with the death of our son, that uh, I knew he'd come around. Three American troops were injured today and five Saudi Arabian troops killed when a truck packed full of explosives drove into a checkpoint on the outskirts of Jeddah. Four months after the death of Joe Knoll, the government continued to maintain U.S. soldiers in Saudi Arabia. A recent poll indicated that 47% of people felt that America could only get back on its feet by maintaining a military presence to protect the supply of oil, while 47% felt that the continued presence of American troops in Saudi could only further damage the economy. Despite public opinion, the government indicated it had no intention of bringing the troops home. Opposing voices were enraged by what they saw as a continuing waste of public money. Adam McGrath and the farmers who had been struggling to produce food without federal aid for months took their grievances to Washington, D.C. With 750,000 angry farmers, Adam McGrath marched toward the nation's capital. Why isn't anyone in Washington talking about this? I think back to the late 60s and seeing those people on TV ranting and screaming and demonstrating. While Adam and I were sitting at home surrounded by babies and diapers. And we just thought they were doing it because they were people with some kind of emotional problems. And now that was us. Today's farmers rally has turned to chaos as marching protesters face a wall of police blocking their way to the state capitol. It was supposed to be a very peaceful demonstration. It got violent. My Adam, he was doing what he thought was right. But he was the figurehead. They needed to take somebody down, and Adam was the biggest, strongest thing around. So they took him down. You got the wrong person. As injuries among protesters and police mounted, Adam McGrath was arrested and held without bail. Mary, get the union lawyer. Get a lawyer, Mary. Arrested him because they had to arrest somebody. He was the leader, right? He was the troublemaker. He had done nothing. They couldn't even drum up charges. They finally decided on inciting to riot. The farmers' riot unleashed a rage that was felt across the nation. Anarchy overtook America. Rioting and chaos gripped the streets of Seattle tonight when the 9 p.m. curfew was broken by protesters. Americans were becoming increasingly angry by the perceived lack of action from the government. This police attempt to restrain protesters, the mayor has called for calm. In San 
Francisco, looting and violence have taken hold of the city. Police today urged the people to stay away from the downtown area. There was crisis every day. There were riots in cities. Nearly everyone was losing their cool. In Boston this morning, an angry mob attacked a heating oil truck, badly wounding the driver. With looting and violent crime escalating across the nation, martial law was imposed in several major cities. America was facing the darkest days in its history. Drastic action needed to be taken to rectify the situation. The government did take drastic action, and in so doing, secured enough oil to bring America back from the brink of collapse. Tommy, no! I got a lot of stuff going on in my head. Stop it! It was never the job, Tommy. It was you. Hey, what time to see, huh? Daddy? Come on, guys. I'm a fireman. Rescue Me premieres Tuesday, June 21st at 10, only on FX. Oil Storm is brought to you by DirecTV. With top-ranking customer satisfaction and 100% digital quality, DirecTV is rethinking the way television should be. Hey, how's it going? Nice shirt. Listen, the bean dip's starting to get a little funky. What? Speaking of outdated, are you still watching digital cable? How'd you get in here? Direct TV has 100% digital quality on every channel. Digital cable calls itself digital, but it's not digital on every channel. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll get on that. Hey, don't leave me in here with the mooshu pork. <laughs> Dark and cold. It's time to rethink TV. Sign up now and get over 140 channels for only $29.99 for the first three months. Call 1-800-DIRECT-TV. At Samuel Adams, hops are to beer what grapes are to wine. They really are the soul of the beer. That's why our founder, Jim Cook, goes to Bavaria each year to hand select the best hops in the world. Most other brews just call in their orders. Oh, this is gorgeous. Some customers only drop them and sniff a little bit. He doesn't sniff, he dives in the hops. The better the hops are, the more complexity, fullness, and richness you're going to get into each bottle of Samuel Adams. Hey, I'm Jimmy. I'm Terry. I'm John. And I'm one of Earthlink's 2,000 employees. I'm your internet service provider. Your ISP. I am not a giant server in an air-conditioned room. I'm a living, breathing, hard-working internet person. Just like you. I'm watching out for you on the internet 24-7. We've created spam blocker. Virus blocker. Spyware blocker. Scam blocker. If there's a problem, we create a blocker for it. We love our jobs. We love what we do and we enjoy it. We're here to protect and serve you. More speed, more security, that's Earthlink. Earthlink, we revolve around you. For my sport, the only sunscreen is Coppertone Sport. It's non-greasy, so I won't lose my grip. And it doesn't run in my eyes, no matter how hard I sweat. Coppertone Sport, high-performance sunscreens. What's inside Minute Maid Light? There's the fruit. There's the fun. There's the flavor. Yet there's just two carbs and five tiny calories. Minute Made Light. Light on calories. Loaded with taste. <laughs> you want my advice? You should never... Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> Only at Friday's new Steakhouse Selects. Choose your cut in one of our signature butter sauces. It'll leave you speechless. Everyone could use more Fridays. You know, this work is by a great artist called Otto Kappelman from uh, 1902. I'm a big fan of his work and uh, his holes. I really dig how he combines, you know, the form with uh, function. Smirnov ice. Please drink responsibly. Premium all beverage made in the USA. Thanks to our 555 deal, that's three pizzas for just five bucks each. Everyone can get exactly what they want. It's changing the way people order pizza. Three pizzas with whatever I want. If I want olive, I can order olive. If I want pineapple, I can order pineapple. But you order three pepperoni. I fear change. 
Domino's 555 deal is back. Buy three or more medium one-topping pizzas and they're all just five bucks each. Get the door. It's the 555 deal. Once you see the world through math and science, you'll never see anything the same way again. Go to girlsgotech.org. You'll see. Breaking news for you, the tankers are coming back to America. The precious Listen to this. Oil is Listen, you shoot? Original Listen. destination, America. Despite last week's alarming... You remember those ships that China was trying to steal our oil with? And they, they're coming back. We outbid them. The greatest country in the world has stepped up to the plate, and the oil's coming back, and we are rising again. Sasha Stanimir had pulled off a last-minute deal to save the American economy and restore national pride. President Bush tonight praised Sasha Stanimir for his diplomatic skills and sensitive handling of a highly delicate situation. Many suggest that it was Stanimir's long-standing relationship with President Putin which provoked the renegotiations of oil for America. If Putin was going to order those ships to turn away from China and back towards America, it was clear that America needed to offer some kind of financial incentive. President Bush told me that he refused to be bullied into paying over the odds for oil. I reminded him that Russia's oil infrastructure was weak and desperate for investment. I suggested that America might be a key player in boosting Russia's oil industry. Stanimir proposed a unique partnership between Russia and America. In exchange for a $16 billion investment into drilling and pipeline expansion, Russia would provide the U.S. with a steady new supply of oil. The deal rippled across the country, boosting morale and restoring the American economy. The oil crisis over the last year has shown us how our reliance on OPEC makes us vulnerable. My belief is that countries like America must look for alternatives and turn to countries like Russia, which have untapped oil resources. One year on from Hurricane Julia, the oil was flowing again, and the infrastructure had been almost totally repaired. Fouchon was back up to 80% capacity. The SPR was being replenished. Even the Saudi Arabian situation had stabilized, albeit with continued support of U.S. troops. But the last 12 months had taken an irreversible toll on the American people. You can compare the oil situation in uh, 2005, 2006 in the United States to the Great Wall Street crash of uh, 1929. You know, we definitely had a lot of speculation going on there. We uh, were very confident in our structure and our source of energy and fuel. We were confident in our economic structure. We were confident in our profit structure. And all of those went away overnight. We felt like a third world country, and it was very scary and very unsettling. And it's something that I don't really think we're going to get over in, for a very long time. Economists from across the country met in Washington today to discuss the extent of damage done to the economy by the recent oil prices. The oil crisis was responsible for the loss of trillions of dollars on Wall Street. It destroyed millions of jobs took tens of thousands of lives. None of this had to happen. A lot of people died unnecessarily. Years from now, when we look back at how we were living up to this point, we will think how stupid we were. 
we need as a nation to start looking into alternative energies that can complement oil because if we continue in the way that we're going um, and we don't find alternative fuels and we don't learn to conserve we can see that how debilitating that it can be what it does to the economy from the top the administration all the way down although deeply unpopular the administration took the first steps toward rebuilding its trust with the nation in September the president announced the reinstatement of federal aid to farmers and in a widely publicized gesture ordered the release of farmers leader Adam McGrath all I did was fight for what I thought was right and I'm going to keep on fighting and I urge all of you never to forget what has happened in this past year we all pull together or we all fall apart and now I'm going home to my family thank you the, the government needs to support the people who provide the basic necessities of life we'll go on without oil we'll go on without gasoline Will we go on without food? No. Since the time of Adam and Eve, you had to have food. I don't think there was a gas station in Eden. As America began the process of getting back to business, Bob Knoll was able to reopen his gas station. Hazel now divides her time between the station and her job in downtown San Antonio. I wasn't really making a, a decision that I, it was over between Bob and I. I just knew that one of us had to be stronger. And to be honest with you, you know, you don't call it quits after 23 years of marriage. Some of the time I had alone has, uh, you know, sort of uh, made me think about some things that I didn't think about before. But maybe that was it. You know, he came around. Now we just take it one day at a time and try to take things slow and, and see what happens. That's what anyone can be expected to do, right? How people learn that they can't take anything for granted. I mean, we took for granted that we could just drive our SUV anywhere we wanted to go, but we can't do that anymore. People learn to tone things down and make sacrifices. This whole nation has been tested. And, and, and just about every family has been touched. And I think there's a reason. I think God has a plan. We are survivors. And survivors have a particular responsibility to those who didn't survive to keep fighting for what's right and keep pushing and not give up. What I would say to people who, who've lived through this crisis is you have to realize why you're here. For me, it was my family and God. And you just give thanks every day in whatever way that is that works for you. It is good to be home. It is so good to be home. <laughs> it's not always easy, but ultimately, yes, life has to go on, doesn't it? But life will never be the same again. Hey, baby. Vanessa. Yo, baby, what up, man? Mommy's at work and everything's fine. From Stephen Bochco Productions. I don't know if I can explain to you in words what's happening to me. Over There premieres Wednesday, July 27th at 10 p.m. only on FX. Junior Banana Split. Sonic's got it, others don't. Treat yourself to Sonic's Junior Banana Split. Almost half the size, but all the taste for just... of your favorite channels for only $29.99 a month. Compare that to cable. I was really sick of the way my cable company was treating us. We didn't know we had options, so we did nothing for years. 
Then I got Direct TV. I had digital cable and it was crazy. Only some of the channels were actually digital. With Direct TV service, 100% of the channels are digital. I got my entire Direct TV system.